So, Joe, I see you finally made it up here with a little bit of, I think, I don't know if it was, uh, you know, uh, confused or we went the wrong way, but, uh, you know, it was raining. You was, uh, you know, I noticed you was at the wrong bam, and that was on Lafayette. And we here on Fulton Street and uh, Rockwell Place. So I think that's where the confusion went at. Tell me about that. I don't know what happened. Oh, it's very interesting. When when people think of BAM, mm -hmm. they think of the big opera house. Hey. And uh, so when you had when you said it was across the street from BAM, yeah. it was easy enough. I didn't have to ask for an address or anything else. I just come in. Across the street from BAM was supposed to be this building. <laughs> except for one thing way I was supposed to be mm -hmm. wasn't across the street from the BAM that everybody knows. Yeah. That's where the confusion came. Okay. Uh, if you had said Fulton Street. Man, yeah, okay, so that was my fault. Some, some, somewhere in, in my memory banks, mm -hmm. oh, that must be that small building that he was talking about. But I still wouldn't have known that the interest this uh, facility yeah. was around the corner. But yeah. All is well that ends well. Yeah. I'm here now, yeah. you're here hey, now. Hey, hey, and, hey. And uh, all is good. All is good. Okay, so uh, I'm glad that we did get that out the way, you know, so you are here. So, uh, so formally, my name is Melvin Isaac. Uh, this is for the uh, community out there in the world. This is the Artistic Talent Show and I have an extraordinary guest over here, an artist, a, a powerful, powerful person to me, you know, that I met at Dorsey Art Gallery. And uh, he's going to uh, share his story and his message to the community. So I am very happy. I'm very honored to have you as my guest here, Joe. Well, thank you, Melvin. You're welcome. And I am very pleased to be here. Mm -hmm. Any opportunity that I have personally to share my story with other people, uh, I take because uh, I believe communication, understanding of one another, and my particular purpose in life mm -hmm. is just to simply help anybody that I meet. Yes, yes. So that's my basic philosophy in life. Okay. Uh, my name is Joseph Belve, mm -hmm. and I am here in my capacity as an artist. Okay. And as that goes, I have a very uplifting story and reason to why I am currently now an artist. And I'll give you the short version of that story. Right. But before you give yeah. me the short version of it, let me ask you the questions here because they're going to fall into your story. Fine. Oh, you, it's definitely going to fall into your story. That so uh, what three words friends and family would use to describe you, Joe? Well, I'll answer that question in this way. What appears to be the underlying reason uh, for me being here, other than love of my fellow man, is, is my particular demeanor. And I am here as an observer and a witness to everything that goes on. The way my mind works is that everything that comes before my eyes or my ears is studied. And the reason why I say observer and witness is because although I take all this information in, whether it be just looking at you or looking at the equipment in this room, It's like a computer. Okay. 
it registers everything, but what it does not do is judge. Oh, that's why I say observe or witness. I don't make any judgment calls. I just take everything in, and I've been that way all my life. Okay, great, great, great answer. How would you describe yourself? Ah. I would say that um, I'm a helper, a facilitator, and I get great joy out of being placed in that position in order to help people. I, my last job, which lasted for 36 years, was in the U.S. Postal Service, but I wasn't boxing mail. I was a union rep for 36 years. So I was in a position for 36 years. Every time I went to work, there was somebody there that needed my help and I was able to help them. And I got great joy from it. Oh, great. What inspired you to wake up every morning? Wow. <laughs> Imagine knowing that in some way, somehow, during the course of the day, I keep going back to the same thing because that's who I am. Uh, I'll be in a position to do good for somebody, someone, or for a group. Mm, okay. Uh, who would you say inspired you? family, my mother, two sisters. Uh, my father wasn't with me, and I had a much older brother, but he was out doing what much older brothers always do. And so I was raised by three very, very strong black women. And that would be my mother, and my two older sisters. And everything that I am today, everything that I aspire to be, in some way came through them or because of them. And the manner in which they, they raised me, protected me, taught me. So they were the base from which I sprang. So what challenges have you struggled with to become an artist? <laughs> <laughs> when I became an artist, yes. when I had aspirations to create art, it was no struggle. I'm basically I'm a well-rounded artist, mm -hmm. but my love is abstract art. And abstract art is playtime from when I initially started right up to now. Now, if there was any struggle to be made, it would be in figurative art uh, or realistic art. You know, buildings, figures, people, things that others could recognize and say, hey, he drew a book. Hey, he drew Melvin. <laughs> yeah. That was a challenge to a degree. But as with everything else, you learn the rules first. And when you learn the rules, which is 70% of anything you do, including being is learning the rules, Learn, knowing what a pencil can do, knowing how to apply the pencil, a paintbrush, knowing what paint will do. So once you learn those rules, then practice makes you perfect. 
but learning the rules is 70% of the job. Practice is that 30, extra 30% that will take you over the top. Hmm. So tell me, how long have you been an artist? I started painting, mm -hmm. creating art on purpose, let's say, on June 24th, 2005. At the time, I was 60 years old. And there's, there's a story behind now that behind that, which I had started to tell you, tell you before. In 2004, mm -hmm. I realized that something was wrong physically with me, and I started going to doctors. They could not figure out what was wrong. That lasted for about a year, and about. A month before April 1st, 2000, I started getting really sick, and the doctors couldn't figure out what was happening. Two weeks before April 1st, 2006, uh, I basically stopped eating. Not because I didn't try to eat, right? because everything they still couldn't figure out what was going on. And at the end of March in 2005, uh, probably March 28th, around, I had made up my mind that I was going to die. And so I started putting things together. At that time, I was president of the Brooklyn Local and I had the responsibility of approximately 3,000 members and their families to deal with. And my sudden absence uh, uh, from that position and duties would, would have given others the opportunity to take advantage of my people. So what I did was I basically called the meeting of my officers oh. at my house because oh. I couldn't go to the office. And I laid out a plan for them to follow. There would be a secession because I was going to move out of the way. And as president, I had the ability to promote. So I promoted my uh, second in command with my position on up the line. And so that they would be a smooth transition and people would not lose any representation by my house. And that morning, I, called, uh, I told my wife I was going to the hospital. And I was going to the hospital so that she wouldn't come home from work and find a dead body oh. in the hospital. Now, at that time, I had been. 14 to 20 days, I had lost sight in my left eye, and my right eye, I could just see a blurry, you know, double vision. And when I got to the hospital, the symptoms at that time were so overt out there and open for everybody to see. The doctors in the uh, emergency room exactly what was wrong. They sent me for an MRI and they found that a very large tumor was growing on my pituitary gland to the point where it invaded my optic nerve cavity. Right. And that's why I was blind. Mm. Wow. So let me give you the short version. That's, that was the up. Uh, three days later, on uh, March 31st, mm -hmm. it looked like I was going to die. 
when my wife came home from the hospital that day, she called everybody. Oh. You want to see him? You better come to the hospital uh, tomorrow. Or I don't know how long he oh. is going to be here. And um, on April, April 1st, 2005, uh, funny, April Fool's Day, mm -hmm. around 3 o'clock in the morning, I decided I was going to say my prayers for the last time. It's the 23rd song. And when I said amen, I was no longer in the hospital bed. I was in a courtroom setting. Hmm. And I said, okay. <laughs> I died. Mm -hmm. And they are judging me. Courtroom <laughs> setting. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a group of people over to the right. Mm -hmm. And slightly over to the left right. was this tall podium where the judge was. Mm -hmm. But the podium was so tall. I could not see the judge behind the podium. Right. And at that time, the scroll came down, and I instantly knew it was everything that I had did oh. in my entire life yeah. was written on that oh. scroll. Oh. And uh, oh. I know my knees were knocking. I had a guard on my left, a right. guard on mm -hmm. my right. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'm going straight to hell. And uh, Judge said, uh, I want you to take this test. And somehow it felt like I was using a computer, but no mouse, mm -hmm. no keyboard mm -hmm. with my mouth. I don't know if you remember the questions, I don't know how it went, but when I finished taking the test, the judge said, you did good, you have two choices. Oh. You can go back and live out the rest of your life, or you can accept the promotion. Oh. I decided to go back <laughs> and live out the rest well, of my yeah. life. And, uh, he ordered the scribe to seal his role. And that was the first time in this whole scenario that I felt comfortable. Because for me, that was like going to juvie court where they seal the records. Mm -hmm. And you don't, anything that's in there, right. you don't have to ever worry about again in life. So on April 1st in 2005, I began a new life with no pass. Wow. Because that scroll was sealed. Mm. I woke up that morning uh, in, in the hospital mm -hmm. and uh, they brought in breakfast. I struggled, I was very, I struggled to get that styrofoam cover off and I ate everything that was there. And I had eaten everything on that little table yeah. and nothing came back up. There you go. And my wife arrived there. She looked at the table <laughs> where I had food on it. She looked at the breakfast thing and she was angry <laughs> going to the. She, <laughs> who ate my husband's <laughs> food? Because <laughs> she knew it wasn't right, me. Right, right. Wow. And I told her, no, no, Valerie, it was me. Mm. I, wow. And that day, the people who were coming, say they last goodbyes found me sitting up in the bed mm -hmm. and uh, talking to them and acting with them uh, on the day three days later I was scheduled for a brain operation to get that tumor out and that was on April 1st now excuse me three days later that was on April 3rd or 4th right Instead of being pushed into the operating room, I was released from the hospital. Really? So, in that courtroom setting, a miracle took yes, place. Yes, it was. A miracle. And I recovered completely. My eyesight came mm -hmm. back. 
the tumor slowly diminished and disappeared. No. And, uh, but in that courtroom setting, when they brought me back, mm -hmm. they brought me back with gifts. Oh, yeah. That over time, it took me, it took time for me to realize what those gifts were. But right now, from that day, April 1st, 2005, up until now, I've been living in the state. Come on. Now, how I became an artist, two months after I uh, got out of the hospital, mm -hmm. on June 24, 2005, mm -hmm. I was downtown Brooklyn paying a gas bill. And when I came out of the building, I was walking to the bus stop, and somebody yelled really loud in my ear from behind go in and buy stuff. And I turned to look to see who was yelling in my ear. I looked up to see where I was and I was in front of an art supply store. Mm. I took one step towards the bus and I said, well, it won't hurt just to go in the store. Right? I went in, bought stuff. <laughs> came out, went home, and I did about five things. Wow. Now, my wife is an art collector and curator and gallery all the time. And she came home, she looked at the work that was on our dining mm -hmm. room table and <laughs> said, who did this? And I said, I did. She said, no, you didn't. <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. when she looked at the brushes and the paint and the pads and stuff that I had there. Yeah. She realized I did. At that time, she called Otto Mills mm -hmm. and called McIntosh over because they lived in the area. They said this was some good abstract work. Mm -hmm. And uh, two months after that, I had my first one man show. Every month after that, for about a year and a half, I had to show every single month. And what's amazing is that it all came back true. The abstract, not the figurative. <laughs> okay, right. It all came easy. Uh, uh, I wasn't really taught in the, the normal sense. Mm -hmm. Nobody sat me down and said, this is how you do it. I never went to school for art. What would happen is every 30 days when I went to work, I had a new skill. So, uh, I was being taught in my sleep yeah. by powers on the scene. And, and that's the miracle of what went on and how I became. There you go. Well, this leads into this question right there is, who are you and what is your purpose in life? Leads right in there. I'm a teacher. Okay. Uh, with emphasis on helping. I have a vast repertoire of skills and knowledge that I try to help others with, to teach others with, so that they can stand up and be whomever or whatever they want to be. And I believe that's my purpose in life. All right. When did you start drawing? After I had my, two months after I started creating art, which was abstract, mm -hmm. I decided that if I wanted to call myself an artist, I had to be able to do figurative work. Okay. And I got books, I had assistance from Carl McIntosh and Otto Neils, 
and I read the books. I learned the language of the skills,、oh. and then I started to practice, and with relative ease, I, I began to create figurative works of art. Graphite drawings, watercolor,、uh, acrylic on paper, canvas, whatever.、Okay. But that that was something that I had to learn. The abstract was a gift from God. Yes. How many mediums did you work in? Good question.、Uh, I do a little sculpting.、Uh, I, like I said, I do figurative work and、uh, graphite, pastel, watercolor, and acrylic.、Uh, I work with wood and clay in the sculpting. I、uh, do prints. Wood cuts, lino cuts, and probably a whole lot of other things that I've forgotten. Do you belong to any art organizations? Well, there's only one that I, I, I would consider myself a party to, and that's the historic、uh, Dorsey Art Gallery、oh. in Brooklyn, New York. Yeah. Have you had any commissions? Uh no, I mean you, you talk about small stuff,、uh, but but nothing that I would consider to be a commission. Okay. So what about work in private and public collections? Oh,、uh, I should have brought a list. <laughs>、um, Stop! But I had、uh, work in two、uh, Fillmore galleries,、uh, uh, Grace Baptist Church, York College, uh, uh, New York University,、uh, Abyssinian. My work is in the Abyssinian、uh, Baptist Church collection. I mean, got a lot. I probably have a list that can fill up two pages,、mm-hmm. and I've forgotten because it's just too、uh, numerous venues to actually remember. I write all of this stuff there. No problem. No problem.、Uh, tell us about Dorsey. How important is Dorsey Gallery to you? Well, that's easy. Dorsey Art Gallery、uh, opened its doors in 1970. The founder of that gallery's interests were children, art, and golf, in that order. And、uh, his interests in art、uh, spread out. Further than most gallery、uh, owners would be, because he was a master framer, and like me, he loved to teach. So he would teach anybody that would listen, whether they were artists, whether they were collectors. You were always welcome. This is a key word. You were always welcome at the doors. Dorsey Art Gallery is the oldest continuously、uh, run, black-owned, operating art gallery in the entire metropolitan area. If, if you think about it, at least a third of the people walking the earth today were not born when Dorsey opened those doors in 1970.、Mm. So that's that's.、It. Over 50 years of, of, of helping young and established artists、mm-hmm. in the community and in the United States 
uh, all of the biggies have gone through uh, the Dorsey Art yeah. Gallery. Uh, Ernie Krishlow, uh, Ann Tanksley, James Denmark, and uh, Jacob Lawrence Bearden, mm-hmm. Elizabeth Catlett. Mm-hmm. All of these great, great artists, Jonathan Green. All of these great artists have pierced those doors and had their works hung on those walls. So, as a black-owned and operated gallery, it is truly historic in nature. Yeah, I'm feeling blessed already hearing uh, <laughs> the spoken word from you. You know, and plus your journey and uh, your spiritual journey, the whole work. So, yeah, it's privileged. So this last question here, well, actually, is, uh, I think is maybe one or two. What do you consider to be the most important in your life of art? Oh, wow. <laughs> I would have to say my abstract, and that's based on the fact that I was taught this skill by unseen forces and I have watched over and over and over again how people are affected by it when they see it. it for them uh, it can be uplifting. At my first one man show at the Fillmore Gallery a young lady came in off the street. She stood in front of one of my paintings and just started to cry. And she asked, is the artist there? And, I, and she came over to me and she said, I just wanted you to know that I'm an artist, but I had stopped working. And looking at your art, it gave me the inspiration to go home take out the paint, the brushes, and the canvas, and start the work. And in many instances, similar stories I have heard about how people react to the work. And it's my belief that every piece of abstract art that I uh, complete is destined to help one person. And eventually, it will do that. Because my abilities are gifts from God, and in many ways I believe that I'm a conduit. That uh, there's a purpose behind the abstract art that goes far beyond. Uh, what what we're gonna do is a couple things. One is that. Uh, your message is here. You have a powerful, powerful story and a powerful message to give to the community and the young artists of every ethnicity, you know, towards building their own lifestyle and going to art, because there's a purpose, purpose for everybody. And you already told your purpose, uh, your purpose, uh, the way I feel that is really coming from God. Uh, that saved you, that brought you back, and it's a reason why you are here. It's a reason why you are talking to me, uh, because now you're not just talking to me, you're talking to over three million people. So it's a reason for this, why we have this interview. And I think uh, it's a bigger than what we think it is, but you are one of the vessels that's gonna share your message to the community. So what I want to do now before we uh, talk a little bit about some of your artwork that is shown on this wall right here, is uh, look in this camera right here and give a message to the uh, to the community. Uh, what message would you give them as far as becoming an artist uh, and what you just went through? So what message would you give them? Creating art is an act of love. And through that creative process, you gain so much on a personal level that that's incredible. When I paint, 
apps uh, when I paint abstract art, I am dancing, I am singing. I hardly pay attention to what I am doing because the forces of God slash love is actually working through me. I happen to paint abstract art flat and uh, it's, it's really incredible. The only thing that I do when it comes to abstract work that I can claim to be my own is I picked out the medium. I pick out the paper and what size. I pick out the canvas and what size. But everything else, my choice of colors, the design within the artwork, is something that works through me. I be enjoying the process, loving it, I be singing, I be dancing, I'm spiritually uplifted and happy, and I know when to stop, and I know when the piece is complete, it's when the name of the piece pops in my head, I've learned to stop, and that's the first time that I really look at it and see what was created. You have an extraordinary story, extraordinary, to talk about, uh, or, or real short, you know, about your artwork that, that is being displayed. You can sum it all up, you know, in a way where people would understand it. <laughs> well, let me put it to you. All my life, all my life, I always wanted to be in a position to help others and assist others the way I can teach others. And uh, with, with the artwork that I am creating, now, it gives me a much, much more dramatic tool to also allow people to see what I see and feel what I feel because the artwork represents glimpses into the world that I actually live in. So when you see my art, you see little tiny snippets of who I am on the inside. And uh, that gives me an opportunity to share me with everyone that sees my art. Uh, well said. You definitely shared it with me, the world, with everything else, with everybody. And uh, it's been a privilege. It's been an honor uh, to have you on my show. I am very pleased. Thank you very much. Well, I am very honored to be here. Yes. And you're a good host because normally, <laughs> no, not normally, I'm a very nervous type person. Mm. Stay in the background mm. and help mm. from behind. Mm. In any organization that that I am, I like the glue. Yeah. Uh, I wherever uh, something that's needed, that's where I step in. But I always have a sort of nervous reaction to public speaking. Mm -hmm. Although I know personally, and people have told me that I do it very well. But still inside, I'd rather not. Yes. And um, but I learned a little trick, and that trick is I don't prepare notes for public speaking. Yeah. Not that I don't have an outline in my mind, but just before I walk through that door, mm -hmm. I said, "Father, from your mind to my lips." Yes, it did.
Yeah, I felt that too from you. You know, there's a spiritual connection here, you know, and I think that's what made you really calm and collected and uh, it's coming from the heart. And once you feel that the environment that you are in or the person, the host like myself that is speaking with you, it, it lets you know that we okay. We all on the same wavelength, so we good, you know. And I think that's what uh, makes you tell your story even much better. So I want to thank you again. It was uh, mm -hmm. a pleasure, an honor to have you as my guest. Thank you very and I much. I want to thank you for this opportunity. Yes. And to share me with everyone that this piece reaches. Mm -hmm. And today, share part of me with you. There you go. Thank you. Well, God is watching. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's there. <laughs> thank you.